The Norman Foster Foundation public debates are now starting. So, good evening everyone. Uh, welcome. This is my pleasure to be with you today, especially because we're going to talk about a key topic, maybe one of the key, uh, most important topics of our era, and that is how to keep peop people healthy not only in the way they live, but also where they live. So, um, my name is uh, Yolanda Arburu. I'm in charge of uh, sustainability at uh, Sanitas, that is a Spanish company, a healthcare company, that belongs to Bupa, a UK-based international healthcare company. And we've come to the uh, conclusion and the firm conviction that we cannot take care of people, the health of people, uh, if they live in unhealthy places. And this is backed uh, increasingly by data. Um, so um, we know by a fact that to take care of people, we need also to be focusing on how the buildings in where they live or the cities where they live are built and designed. Um, more data on that. So 70, between 70 and 80% of our health is determined by the lifestyle we lead and also where we live. And that's even more relevant in cities, which is where in Europe, for example, 70% of people live nowadays. And so for that reason, we have partnered with the Norman Foster Foundation because we do want to work across different sectors. We want to learn more about that uh, phenomenon and we want to be um, an engine for change in that respect. Um, we do need to partner with people, with other uh, experts to, to do that. So um, in 2015, we launched the program Healthy Cities that aimed at promoting physical activity among people. And we came together with other companies to encourage employees to maintain a step challenge to improve their health. Um, but not only that, Sanitas, uh, what we did was to match that commitment with personal health, with investing to rewild and to regenerate urban spaces, which is where most of us live, as I was saying. And uh, with that, we uh, contribute to public health as well as personal health. Um, so um, to do that, we need partnerships. We started working with the Spanish Heart F uh, Foundation. We also work with the Spanish Olympic and Paralympic Committee with Real Madrid and now with the Norman Foster uh, Foundation. So we want to lead change and we want to uh, learn more and gain more expertise about how to create healthier cities. And that's the reason why we are having this debate today. So uh, we expect to learn more about that. So let me explain a little bit how this is going to work. So we are going to have two parts of the debate. So in the first part, we are going to focus on how the uh, cities impact the personal health of people. And in the second part, we are going to focus on how to create uh, healthier buildings and uh, urban spaces. So um, for that, uh, let me explain a little bit the logistics. We will start with a five minute uh, keynote speech by three great experts that we have invited. Uh, we have uh, Beatriz Colomina, Director of Graduate Studies at the School of Architecture at the University of Princeton. She will be followed by Maria Neira, Assistant Director General of the World Health Organization and Director of its Department of Environment, uh, Climate Change and Health. And to complete this trio, we will have Susana Sai, Director of Sustainability and Energy at Arup in Spain. And also after that will come um, a second part of the debate that will be uh, led by uh, Joseph Allen, who will be talking to us about uh, healthier um, buildings. Uh, Joseph Allen is um, director of the uh, program of healthy buildings at the T. Uh, Chan uh, School of Public Health in Harvard University. And after that, uh, he will be having a conversation with Norman Foster, president of the uh, Norman Foster Foundation. So um, we'll go. Um, First, uh, calling Beatriz to come on stage with me. After that, when you finish, then Maria will follow suit and then uh, Susana will follow suit. And then uh, we will come uh, all together to lead the first um, sharing of what the, uh, the data you, you shared was uh, like and we can discuss a little bit about that. So uh, please, Beatriz, when you're ready, thank you. Thank you. Does it work? 
Thank you very much. Uh, it doesn't seem to work. Um, I'm very happy to, to talk to you about the cities in the age of, uh, of pandemics. In architecture uh, discourse, we have always centered in this, uh, in the, in, on the body. Okay? But the body that we have always centered all the way from the Renaissance uh, drawings to Le Corbusier, from Leonardo's to El Modulor, is this athletic, male, uh, young, healthy uh, body. And what I'm trying to uh, talk to you about is that at the center of architecture is a completely different body. It's a very fragile uh, body, already sick or, or prone to sickness at least. And that architecture is a protective um, uh, uh, cocoon, a kind of artificial skin, if you want, or an orthopedic support to, for this very fragile uh, uh, creature. And it's very interesting to see that architectural discourse from the beginning has been medical and has thought about the, um, uh, the building as a medical uh, instrument. So it's very important that we don't forget uh, this because we seem to be forgetting it uh, recently, or not so recently anymore. But of course, this is a very famous image for all of you in, in, uh, in Madrid of the uh, uh, a field hospital that was established in, in very few days in uh, the beginning of uh, March in IFEMA, in a place that is normally for convention halls, etc. So uh, a place for uh, temporary events is occupied by a medical uh, uh, hospital. 5,500 uh, beds. And it's all, of course, very, very modern. And it's not just Madrid, it went very fast. This is Belgrade, uh, and it's uh, New York, the Javits Center. So all over the world, this situation happened of occupying industrial spaces with thousands and thousands of beds, right? But it's also very important to remember that it's not the first time that we were in that situation. We tend to forget previous pandemics. This is 1918, again, cavernous space occupied by thousands of, of beds in the United States, right? So we have been there uh, before and we tend to forget about it. Um, in fact, I'm not going to talk so much about the architecture of emergencies, but precisely about the architecture of normality, the way in which past health crises are inscribed in our everyday uh, uh, life. As this uh, fellow um, already argued uh, in this book that was uh, published in connection with the uh, International Health Exhibition of London in 1884, and these are uh, some of the illustrations in the catalog, he writes, man in constructing protection from exposure has constructed the conditions of the seas. So architecture and the seas are in fact inseparable from the very beginning. In fact, this has been demonstrated even recently with these excavations in the Neolithic that demonstrated that as soon as we went indoors, we developed uh, and, uh, diseases like tuberculosis, right? So uh, this is uh, very important because uh, uh, it's going too fast. I don't know why it's going fast. I'm not touching it. Is it on automatic or something? I was trying to say that uh, pandemics uh, leave a trace in the city, but we tend to forget uh, uh, as soon as the pandemic or the emergency passes, we t tend to develop all collective amnesia, right? So we were all surprised when we were asked to, to put together this, uh, to wear this mask, but that, those masks were not very different from the ones that the Red Cross uh, was using in, uh, in, in Boston during the uh, pandemic of uh, 1918 or the mask of this plague doctor of the 18th century with this long beak. You know why it's long? To keep people at bay, right? And also it had the capacity to have scented uh, herbs in there because it was believed, it was the miasma theory of the disease, that the smell was the cause of contagion, right? And think about the parallelism between these two images, cholera in Palermo in 1835, and some of the images of some of us living in New York in the early days of the pandemic got used to it. So New York, March 2020, right? And of course, uh, we can say that cities uh, had been really designed uh, by pandemics. Eh? Uh, this is, uh, of course, the great stink of 1858 in London and the construction of the embankment of London with the sewage uh, system. So everything we have in the city, all the infrastructure that was put in place in the 19th century, clean water parks, urban parks, sewage, etc., was in response to the pandemics of that period, eh? to cholera, etc. 
Uh, but it goes even further back. When you go back to Vitruvius, and these are the uh, treatises that were published in the, in the Renaissance, the teacher, Vitruvius is already arguing uh, can we go back? that an architect should also study medicine, as if we didn't have enough studying architecture. Why is it important that we study medicine? Because uh, health is the most important issue of an architect, right? And how you determine the health of a city by killing an animal that lives there and studying the liver. And if the liver is sound and firm, that's a good place for a city. And likewise, for the health of, um, of a building, he uh, talks about the theory of the four humors, which was the theory dominant at that time, and argues about how to design uh, a good, uh, healthy building. <coughs> it's very interesting that the first schools of architecture, Academia del Diseño in Florence in, in, the, in the 1500s, uh, by Vasari, uh, it could have been established anywhere in the city, I suppose. They put themselves <coughs> next to the medical schools, and they are sharing a lot of information, right? Among other things, the students of architecture, the students of Academia del Diseño, were obligated to attend dissection in the same way that the students of medicine uh, were attending dissection, <coughs> except that the students of design were supposed to be drawing for days on end this body that was putrefying, that was decomposing, despite the fact that there were reports that they were getting sick, etc., etc., right? And of course, uh, uh, techniques of uh, medicine, like dissection, become very important parts of architecture as well. And in the sketchbooks of uh, Leonardo, you see anatomic drawings next to architectural and design uh, uh, drawings. When you get to modern architecture, you can also argue that modern architecture was also produced under emergency conditions. Like millions of were dying of tuberculosis all over uh, the world. In fact, one in four all over the world was dying in, in tuberculosis at the end of the 19th century. And in big cities like Paris, it was more like one in three, right? So modern architecture was really um, uh, conceived as a prophylactic against this, uh, this deadly bacteria. Everything that you know about uh, uh, architecture, wide buildings, uh, detached from the ground, terraces for the sun, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, were uh, uh, precisely conceived to um, counter uh, uh, tuberculosis. How do we counter tuberculosis? The first thing was to demonize 19th century architecture, right? So this is the Weizenhof C.S. Bloom. This is what we are not going to do, right? Because the 19th century interior is unhealthy, it's full of dust, and we need a modern uh, White House as this of Le Corbusier to produce the healthy body. But uh, even at a popular level, women were advised by um, uh, home magazines to leave petri dishes in their living, living room to make sure that apart from having cleaned the house, you have, they have also eliminated the bacteria in the house, in their living rooms, right? So, of course, now we know that eliminating bacteria was a huge problem for, for, for humanity, right? We have created all the diseases of our time precisely by eliminating uh, uh, bacteria. Modern architecture was antibacteria, was an antibiotic before antibiotic was even invented. There was no penicillin until 1928, but architects and their buildings were already with this antibiotic uh, uh, attitude that in many ways has created many of the problems that I'm sure we will talk about uh, uh, today, uh, including health, uh, health issues like uh, sick syndrome building, but also all these allergies, all these forms of cancer that are all uh, uh, precisely the reduction of the biodiversity, uh, reduction of, of bacteria. I will talk a little bit about Alto, but we don't have time. Alto and his famous sanatorium, very important. Uh, Alto had been sick at the time of the commission of the building, and he says he realized that architecture is always being conceived for the vertical person. But here you have a client that is constantly on the horizontal. And then he goes on to argue that the architect should always design for the person in the weakest position. And here you have the reversal of all the Vitruvios and, <laughs> and modulors. So Aino Alto on the terrace of, uh, of Paimio, not the heroic architect uh, standing in front of their building, but uh, the fragile body in the terrace of a tuberculosis uh, sanatorium. Thank you very much. Thank you, and uh, it's a pleasure to start where you left because one of my favorite positions is horizontal. 
And a friend of mine used to say that the best things in life are done horizontal, but I don't know what he was thinking about it. <laughs> anyway, let's go back to the serious thing. Uh, starting first by the first, I'm sorry, but I need to give you some data, some numbers. I know that those are the most boring ones, but uh, when we talk about health, there is no choice. We need to start with what uh, matters for all of us. One, seven million premature deaths every year caused by exposure to air pollution. I mean, this is a figure that I repeat constantly, but I still myself, I can't believe this is true, and we are not doing anything about it. Well, we are doing something, but not at the level of the proportion of the magnitude of the problem. Imagine that in normal circumstances, if somebody will tell you that every year you have seven million premature deaths caused by, exposed to something that you need, you dramatically need, you need to breathe. We can't stop breathing. You will then react uh, with, uh, you know, panic or, or at least uh, taking some action. Well, it's not the case. For some reasons, we do not respond to the fact that we are breathing air that is killing us and uh, we are not taking the measures that we should compare with, as I say, the magnitude of the problem. And this polluted air that we breathe is very much related to the way we live in the cities, in our urban space. And of course, in parts of the world, it's very much related to the fact that they are still using um, very dirty fuels to cook heat in the house, or they, they cook like in the Stone Age, I mean, with an open fire, and then, of course, that uh, uh, will go to your lungs. So the first thing I wanted to put you is in this uh, situation where most of our cities our citizens are breathing air that is not compatible with perfect conditions or at least the good conditions to promote our health. The other figure that I would like to, to put on the table is the fact that if we were good on creating this association between, between healthy urban planning and, uh, and, and public health, we could reduce 30% of the global burden of diseases. We could reduce 13 million deaths every year. Imagine if we join forces here, uh, the, the, the mission, the incredible goal that we could have together, reducing 20%, 25% of the global burden of diseases of the total number of deaths every year. And that's why is because we will be interacting with the environment around us, the one that will condition, the one that will determine our health or our lack of health. Um, Albert Einstein was saying that uh, when they asked him what is the environment, or at least the people say that it was Albert Einstein, you know, all of those quotes you, you can never verify. But when they asked him what's the environment for you, he says, well, environment is everything except me. So it's everything around me. So everything will determine our health, starting with a smile in the morning to the light, to the air we breathe, the water, the quality of the, the food, the pesticides, everything that, the cream we put in our body, everything will determine, good or bad, our health. So imagine the fantastic opportunity we have here. So first is first, health can be the driving, the, 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 the motivation, the most powerful argument to do much more on the way we will be designing our cities, planning our cities, our urban environment, and I'm sure that this association is the natural one from now on it. Um, Leonardo da Vinci was mentioned already twice here, is my favorite, one of my favorites. Leonardo da Vinci was saying, again, who knows whether this quote is true or not, that the cities are places where people have to be not only healthy, but happy. I suppose that for an architect, uh, planning and doing something for the happiness of the people should be the final motivation. For us, as the public health officers, if we can have cities where people at least can be healthy and their health will be protected, that will be already a fantastic opportunity. What do we mean by this uh, critical union between uh, healthy, uh, um, planners, urbanists, uh, architects, mayors. Mayors will play a critical role as well. Well, what do we need from all of you, from a public health point of view? Of course, today our ambition goes far beyond just to prevent tuberculosis or infectious diseases or potential epidemics or pandemics. 
Uh, of course, we will learn and we, we have to, to prepare even our cities where many people live and therefore the transmission of infectious agents will be facilitated. We know all of that, but we, we are much more ambitious than that. What we need today, what we need from you are very simple, very modest, green spaces. Because we need to take care of the mental health of the people. And there is no mental health if you cannot interact, if you don't have a place where you can see a, a green and, and, and blue sky if possible. I mean, people in India, they don't know what a blue sky is. And uh, that's something that uh, for your mental health is critically important. So green spaces, gardens or, or, or trees and the, whatever, but think about the green for, for us being able to have a, a mental health protected. We need now, unfortunately, more and more climate refuge. You saw what's happened in London one year ago when the, they reached 43 degrees in London and they couldn't cope with that. It was just one day, lucky. But if not, they are not prepared. So more and more because we will be having uh, extreme weather events uh, caused by climate change, we will need places in our cities where people can be uh, protected. I mean, people who have not air conditioning at home, they can go there and they can at least study or, or being protected uh, and, and have a normal life. Third, we need energy efficient buildings. We need, of course, ventilation, but at the same time light, at the same time places where we can have solar energy or renewable energy. We need cities without cars. Please think about the humans as the center of your urban planning. It's not the car. I'm very jealous of the cars. Cars are, are the kings or the queens of the cities and not us as humans. They have everything. They have parking spaces. They have everything is for them. Do you realize that? And it should be for us. We should be planning for us. So we need this type of cities where we will be able to walk and then sanitas, you will have a lot of savings every year because you will have less sedentary lifestyle related diseases, more active lifestyle, less uh, diabetes, less uh, metabolic uh, <laughs> syndrome. So think about all of that from a health point of view. And then let's take this uh, from a political point of view, take it to the COP28, I mean to the negotiations on climate change, because whatever we need to do in terms of uh, transitions and then transformations for, for a healthy life are in the, in the COP, in the, in the Paris Treaty, three transitions. Transition to um, clean, resource, uh, clean uh, renewable energy, a transition to sustainable food systems, and the last one is a transition to a healthy urban planning. Our cities are the place where most of our population will be living, so it's up to us to make sure that it's a place that will protect our lungs, our brains, our, the rest of our body, including our mental health. Thank you. Well, thank you for the great presentations. Uh, I'm going to try to build on uh, Maria's uh, presentation and try to put some order to how we measure all these concepts, all these interdependencies that Maria has been touching on. What are the metrics for healthy communities and healthy cities? And I would like to start by the determinants of health. It's an extremely complex uh, diagram. It is, if I ask around here, what is health for you? It will be totally different answers, I'm sure, because it is about myself as an individual. It is about the food I eat. It is about the activity. Uh, it is about my environment, my community, my social interactions, my genetic background. So this is extremely complex, multi-factor um, concept. Uh, but I like to land it into a very straightforward, very um, simple, but a really, really fundamental definition of what is health from the World Health Organization. It is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, fundamental right leading to what Maria mentioned, happiness at the end. That's how I like to see that. All this complexity is about being able to develop myself to my maximum potential as human being. And of course, this is really related to the place where we are um, living, the global ecosystem we belong to, the natural environment that has been 
affecting our evolution over 99% of history of humanity and just over the last uh, centuries has been cut from our um, immediate interaction. Um, the consistent service that we enjoy, the natural habitats that we relate to, they are shaped by the built environment. The built environment is shaping the places, the roots, the connections that I have with my natural environment, the economic activities. It's shaping my community, my social capital, the networks, the way I relate to other people, the intergenerational uh, relationships. And of course, it's shaping my lifestyle, the way I eat, the way I move, the, the way I work and my life work balance, that is really affecting and interacting with my personal condition as human being. And I like to shape it as a, as a matrix, a very complex matrix where if we uh, deal with this type of interactions, like if we deal with ecosystems, so we study the biotope, uh, that is like the, the, the connections between the, the human, the, the, living, the living bodies and, and the environmental conditions that, that shape the ecosystem, we will have one of these matrix for every single individual because it's about all my characteristics as, as human being, and my sex, my age, my condition, my cultural background, and how that relates to the different parameters of the built environment in the society. So extremely complex uh, issue. Um, but if, if we look at that, as, um, as Beatriz was saying, 80% of the factors involved in our health condition are not related to medical care, are related to the environment where I grow and I develop my lifestyle. And in looking at that, we can say firmly that the role played by architecture and urban design is absolutely critical in this, uh, in this concept. Looking at different rating systems, indexes, trying to understand how we measure this complex issue of health in communities and, and, and cities, many of these uh, aspects are common ground in all these indicators. Looking at the different dimensions of health, uh, the physical dimension, the social dimension, mental dimension, looking at air quality, water quality, the spaces where I connect, the green connection, uh, safety, how I feel like in my community, and also my, my habits, my healthy um, diet or not healthy, my activities, all this is really determined how is the, healthy, uh, the health status of a community and of a city. And this is really um, having impact. I mean, in places where we take these initiatives, these aspects, and we translate them into strategies, the reporting benefits are being quantifiable. Many different strategies are used for measuring, like from surveys, from data, physical conditions, physical data, and that is translated into what we call self-report well-being um, analysis. Just an intervention like a park can, in, can increase the perception of well-being in a person by 64%, which is huge. And why we are looking at these aspects, Maria was mentioning already that the air quality is really one big problem. 90% of the world population breathes air that is not even meeting the standards that the, that the World Health Organization has set. Uh, we see that lack of physical activity is already the fourth cause of mortality worldwide. Huge problem. Obesity is a huge problem, but not just that. Unhealthy diets can lead to depression. That's huge mental, uh, mental problem that we are seeing more and more in developed countries mainly. Uh, but also the link to daily patterns, the capacity of, of uh, keeping our circadian rhythms alive, um, the, the capacity of concentrating and enjoying without the strong uh, sources of noise, for example. Um, and this is a big data problem. Unfortunately, computation and analysis, big data sets, geographical information systems are really giving us a really good support. They are allies in this analysis of why and how we can measure um, health uh, conditions and health determinants in our cities. I just wanted to bring you an example that a study done in New Zealand last year that was trying to tackle obesity in children. Uh, with these big sources of data, data from surveys, data from the municipality, uh, together with Google Street View data, they were able to track activity spaces for these kids, the mobility patterns, the food they had access to, the food uh, outlets that they have around their school, around their houses. And with all this information, they could understand what was the problem and how to tackle that. 
We can tackle that with policies, but we, we can tackle that also with information, with education. So what they did with this data is to launch an education campaign, putting advertisements in specific points that were informed that this analysis is extremely effective because kids were seeing the impact of their habits and led to a different choices and different personal decisions. And when we look at, uh, sorry, again, the, the wrong button. And finally, what is the best city where we can live in? Uh, there are many different rankings. Many, there are many different, different um, 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 cities that are listed there, but they are all, those that are in the leading positions, they all share many uh, common attributes. Healthy diets, Valencia, Mediterranean diet, Madrid, Mediterranean diet, activity, activity, walkability. These cities have been demonstrated that they have like a much higher activity rate, walking rate than other cities that cannot enjoy so many hours of sunlight, for example. Access to community spaces, social interaction, those cities really enhance and promote social interaction. Um, cultural places, beauty in our places, that's something that is also a key factor affordable housing like we have in Vienna, um, clean air and also good work family balance as key elements of what we call healthy determin health, uh, determinants of healthy environments and healthy cities. So we have all the tools, we have the data and probably with all this you are all really um, willing to take, the, take the, the route to designing more healthy communities leading to happiness that is the final goal for every human being. Uh, together. Thank you. Well, so let me thank you for these great uh, introductions and keynote uh, speeches, which are uh, eyes opening, I hope, and uh, uh, providing inspiration. I think we can, after that, uh, walk away with a clear view of uh, the central whole, uh, um, role that uh, health is playing in our uh, cities and in our personal health. So uh, uh, to um, uh, go further deep in what you explained to us, uh, let me, let me uh, uh, ask you some questions that I'm sure that are common in the, in the room. So uh, uh, Beatriz, from your presentation, you have told us about the different moments in history where architects and doctors and medicine have uh, become together. But do you think that a uh, relationship and that a uh, collaboration is existing? Uh, is it common? And, and then I would like to hear Susana and Maria's uh, views on that too. Right, it, it has existed from the beginning of architectural theory. This is the amazing thing. And, and you can see in the very brief presentation that it goes from, from Rubius to, to to modern architecture and their really obsession, uh, which was an obsession of the time, with tuberculosis, and their collaboration with doctors in places like Davos uh, to create uh, the conditions for the cure of this uh, deadly uh, disease. But also architects took upon themselves the responsibility of designing buildings that in a way have learned from the sanatorio, right? Big terraces for the sun, ventilation, big windows, white walls, etc., etc. Right? So at that time, there's still a very strong collaboration. And somehow, uh, uh, we dropped the ball. Right? And I think it's very interesting that now uh, uh, you are taking this issue, because architecture has an enormous uh, responsibility in health issues. One of the issues we haven't brought about uh, yet is the question of, uh, of the microbiome. There is a microbiome in buildings. I'm now, uh, Mark and I are now collaborating uh, with uh, scientists on, on this question. And, uh, for example, it was incomprehensible for a long time why kids' uh, babies born of this area had some incomprehensible health problems uh, in the first year of life. A year after they were born, they have the microbiome, not of the mother, because they hadn't passed through, through the vagina, but the microbiome of the building. And, you know, these sterile uh, uh, places where uh, the cesarean is taking place has very deadly bacteria, right? So architecture has an enormous impact. And of course, all this antibiotic architecture, antibacterial campaign of modern architecture was very good for tuberculosis, but end up creating other problems, diminishing the bacterial diversity. We are talking now about what is called a silent extinction. 
mm -hmm. uh, which is actually, according to some scientists, more dangerous, more damaging, more mm, to the human species, even at climate change, because it's going faster, right? And the diminishing in, in the bacteria of our bodies is putting us at a huge risk. And, and, and if you think that doesn't, doesn't have anything to do with architecture, it does have to do a lot with architecture. So we have to start thinking about this. So what are your views on this, Maria and Susana? Uh, you know, I always, uh, when I have the opportunity to meet with mayors, I always tell them that they are our ministers of health because a mayor has the possibilities to look at different sectors. But now more and more my favorite ministers of health are the architects and urban planners. And, and I don't want to put you an extra um, responsibility here, but uh, definitely this is the new alliance that we need to create. But we need to decide whether this alliance is just because we are all environmentally friendly and we need to do it as a kind of tax that we all need to pay these days, or we do it because we believe on that. And for a public health point of view, we really believe on that. I mean, the, the, the urban design, the, the, the whole city will be planned to keep in mind the health of the people and not just the absence of disease. So now it's not just to prevent in TB. Is, is much more, is making people happy, make, make people able to walk, to be less sedentary, as I said before, or, or even breathing an air that is not killing you. So the challenges are huge, and we have an enormous opportunity to do it in a very creative way. So they can be our new ministers of health, making sure that we will create the urban environment, the conditions that will provoke, create, protect, and promote the health that we all need, including those who are providing curative services. We can't afford to have our hospitals full of patients. We need to do something before that. Mm -hmm. So this new relationship between architects and, uh, and doctors is, is happening again. And I think the, the, the COPs, I mean, the, the, uh, the negotiations around climate change that are happening every year, this year we will have a special space, we will have a health day at the negotiations of the climate change and we are putting in the focus on these three transformations that I was describing before and one of them is all of this urban planning, urban design for people, for healthy people. So you are our real partners now and we believe on that. So it's not just the tick something that today everybody has to do. At home, I'm married to an architect, so we are <laughs> applying already we are convinced. That, so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But uh, what I'm here is, uh, Beatriz said, we dropped the ball at some point. Yes, we did. And uh, Maria is talking about what should happen and uh, what our uh, expectations are, but is, is it really happening, Susana? I would think? say so. I mean, I think over the last years, we have seen like, um, there are like um, associations working together, uh, doctors, medical, medical um, <coughs> sector, with architects, with uh, designers, with contractors. Um, for example, the Delos Institute was one of the first ones that joined both forces together and started to develop what are the standards that are going to define what is a healthy building. Uh, the design strategies are absolutely fundamental in medical data. We do have even experiences where we see people that are being monitored and, and this insight, the user experience of these people, how the architecture is, is influencing their physical uh, health, their mental health, their behavior, is uh, being transformed into different design strategies. So let's say the medical, the, the evidence-based design is, is an absolute trend, and we love data. It is one thing, and, and we like constraints as architects, and we like to bring more insight into design. So I really think it's happening, and it's a huge trend. I mean, when we started to see like standards coming into the market with uh, tackling health at the center, like we have been using sustainability as one of the drivers over the last 20 years. When we started to talk about health, the rate of, uh, of um, adoption was incredibly high because health is touching every single human being. So it's a way more appealing topic. Uh, people really relate to that. So I think it's happening, and, and I think it's, it's, it's been a transformational um, route, having this connection between the medical science and the architecture. Uh, so could it be uh, that it's not happening at the scale and at the pace that we need, maybe? What do you think, Beatriz? 
Well, you know, I was aware that it was not happening because I am a historian and I was working on these things of tuberculosis and I was in this Institute of Advanced Studies in Berlin and the, the majority of the other um, scientists uh, there were, you know, the, the other people, the other fellows there were scientists. And when they were listening to me, they became very interesting when I gave my lecture and they said, where, where did all of this go? And I'm talking about 2014, 2015, and at that time I didn't see a lot of architects interested in the medical issues of our time, right? Uh, and, and this is how this collaboration started. The scientists there had a, 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 a kind of a group, and, and they were very interested in the environment, in the effect of the environment uh, on, on, of architecture, particularly on the microbiome, which is a huge, is, is a huge issue. Uh, you, of course, have heard about the microbiome in, in health, how it's affecting the way we think about our bodies and everything. All our bodies are bacteria. We are a bag of bacteria. We have f millions of bacteria in our body. There are more bacteria in our bodies than human cells. And the human cells that we have depend on these bacteria to function. So we are the product of this active collaboration. And, and we have uh, somehow managed to disturb this, uh, this balance. Right? And architecture has played a role in it. That's why we need, we need to pay a lot more attention. And it's a serious, it's a problem of survival. The survival of the species dep depends on this. This group of scientists includes people that are going now to indigenous communities in the Amazon because they have the richest microbiome in the world. And they are coll collecting uh, fecal uh, matter to establish a, a world bank of, uh, of bacteria, bacteria that we don't have anymore in the developed world and that is responsible for a lot of the diseases we have, a lot of the diseases, also the mental health, the microbiome, <laughs> the bacteria in our gut is fully responsible for our mental uh, health as well, so not only our physical uh, health. I gave you the example of the uh, Caesarea, but pylori, for example, pylori, H. pylori, uh, you know, in some people produce uh, stomach ulcers. Right? There were some doctors that say, oh, well, we should eliminate pylori from everybody. Big mistake, because pylori has turned out to be a great protector against stomach cancer. Okay, you, what do you prefer to have? An ulcer in your stomach or stomach cancer, right? So we have created a much bigger problem. Uh, and some people were affected by these ulcers, but not everybody needed to eliminate uh, a pylori. And so with so many other uh, uh, diseases of our time, new diseases, right? Yeah. Maria, uh, what actions do we need to take to make our, uh, our cities healthier? You talked about the cars, the green spaces. What, what are the main things that we need to be focusing on? Uh, I, I think I, I, can, I will take from where you, you finished no? on the, on the um, very uh, vertical approach to our health. I mean, uh, the medical community, and I'm a medical doctor by training, so I apologize for that, but sometimes we tend to see the disease super specialized. Right. Today, that's why public health is becoming more and more important. We need to have this holistic vision. We cannot, uh, like in, in any, when you repair something, you need to be aware that if you repair this, maybe you are destabilizing other piece of your uh, IKEA, table, for instance, you need to, to do it properly. So this holistic approach as the public health community, looking at uh, the different conditions, this uh, ventilation, light, light is so fundamental for all of us. Of course, the green spaces, but more places where we can uh, walk, we, have, we can bike, we can uh, at least have an, a physical activity and interact and maybe Again, those buildings at the moment, it depends where you live, but you, you have cities where you, you still have the, the incineration of waste in most of the cities. Where you have uh, outside a car in Senegal, you see something which is a funny green color, and when you approach it, you say, is that um, green space? No, it's plastic. It's, it's plastic, it's the tons of plastic. It's uh, going to the beach and then again, tons and tons of, of plastic. So we, let's be on this association and, and because we dropped the, the, the medical wall with the architects a long time ago, we need to reinvent now our, uh, our collaboration. It has to be very creative and not vertical. It has to be 
What is the city we can afford? I mean, when I see cities like Aviles or, or Bilbao, sorry if there is somebody from Aviles, I'm from Asturias, so I apologize for that, but Aviles one, was one of the ugliest cities in the world, sorry. <laughs> Anyone from Aviles? And Bilbao was not a pretty city either. What it took, it was somebody with a political willingness, of course, with minimum of vision. I don't know whether the plan was done thinking on the health of the people, but even if it was by, by intuition, the results were amazing. Even Bogota was a very violent city with some interventions there. You can change even violence in the, in the city. So please, we need to think together on a holistic way. Uh, I'm not talking about idealism here or a Greenpeace approach. We are talking about something very creative and, and not like Brasilia in Brasil, uh, please, no. That's not the model of city we want. It's super boring. So <laughs> when I saw Canberra here in the list, I was very surprised. It's perfect, but it's so boring. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I, I'm not making friends today, but you know, I, I'm sure it's possible. If it was possible in Aviles and in Bilbao, it's possible everywhere. Mm. Think holistically, join forces, be creative, and keep in mind the health argument. That's so powerful. Yeah. And Susana, from an urban design point of view, focusing, for example, on air pollution, what should be done to eliminate or to tackle that problem in cities? Well, the city is like Canberra. <laughs> <laughs> that having really addressing air pollution, it, it is a, very linked to all the measures that are being taken for climate change mitigation. Removing combustion from the urban environments, removing uh, suspended solids, that's the main cause of, of, uh, of uh, pulmonary diseases. Um, so this is one of the main measures linked to climate change. You are getting like an indirect direct effect on air quality. So that's the main strategy. We cannot rely just on the capacity of absorption of green spaces to no. tackle green pollution. So we have to reduce as a, first, as, a, as a first thing. But I would say like air quality is one of the parameters, but there are many more, many more parameters that I think that we should consider at the time of urban planning. I, I absolutely agree with that read. The idea of uh, fo uh, fostering connections with our ecosystem, that is going to be key in achieving the health uh, condition that we want in our cities. It's going to enrich the, ma the macrobiota because you are exposing people to the, uh, the vegetation, the fauna, the biodiversity. Mm -hmm. That's one of the main crises that we are facing also, and that's going to be uh, to make us be stronger. Mm -hmm. okay. it's, it's, the, it's the capacity to, to adapt to our ecosystem, what is going to really enhance our health um, patterns, I think, in our cities, and, and create connections. The people need connecting to other people, intergenerational spaces where you can connect to, to, to different, different ages, different, different cultures. That's key for, for healthy, healthy communities. So beyond quality and the physical conditions and the physical determinants, I will really focus also on the human-centered human design and enabling these connections to happen. Sorry, we, we forgot uh, an, a critical element I think you were referring to, which is the commuting. Uh -huh. So we need a sustainable transport system that will avoid the use of the private cars and that the one that will respond to the need of the people in terms of commuting, I mean, the, the moving around the city. So a sustainable, um, not uh, pollutant uh, transport system is fundamental which will respond to the needs of those who are less privileged, uh, economically speaking. So um, low cost and, and responding to the needs. Yeah, a multimodal, active. Mm -hmm. So it's, that's, that's really there. And uh, is there anything that, uh, is there anything? There are many things, I suppose, but can we do more from academia, professionals, the organizations, companies, healthcare uh, organizations, what else can we do on this goes for the three of you before we close? We can do so much more. We, can, we have become silos in architecture school for a long time. We were only doing very, very limited things. We should again open up, be much more uh, uh, curious about what is happening in other fields, to understand, to collaborate with, with uh, people in other uh, disciplines precisely because we have a, a common cause, right? And we, when we talk about uh, um, human-centered design, you can say, I was thinking about, again, Vitruvius and all the treatises of the Renaissance. We have been human-centered for a long time. The problem is that this human 
tends to be white, tends to be male, tends to be athletic, tends to be young, tends to be healthy. Okay. It doesn't correspond to almost anybody. Half of the population for a start is out, right? And then if you think about it, when we are young, we are vulnerable. When we are old, we are vulnerable. When we are pregnant, when we are sick, when we have cancer, when we are going through chemotherapy. Most of our life, when we break a lake skin, it could be anything, right? And in those moments, you realize that nothing actually works, right? Mark broke his Achilles, broke his Achilles <laughs> a few years ago, and then we realized that nothing in New York was was uh, was right. Of course, you, you you we have to decide. It could be human centered, but we have to be a lot more inclusive. So I was very touched by Alto's idea, and I think it's to me it's like the road not taken in architecture because he says we should the architect should design for the person in the weakest position, and of course this. It's like the, the road not taken in, in architecture on disabilities, which we tend to resolve adding a ramp or, you know, or adding something that doesn't work very well, right? So if we design already with the idea that not everybody is healthy, and then everybody else will take care of themselves, right? So this is also part of the health issue, to think in a more inclusive, in a, of age, race, and, and, and socioeconomical conditions, yeah. and, and so many other. So, Susana Maria, your closing remarks? Well, I would say, like, well, humans, in the, in the overall sense, is, includes every type of human. Yeah. Like maybe it's our conception of humans. So it's, right. it's, it's covering everything. We were mentioning in, in, uh, intergenerational design, right. um, linked to the ecosystem design. So that's really um, one of the main, main things. And I will call for that. I think, I think uh, looking beyond ourselves, looking at our community and the connections will be really uh, the basis, as, as Charles Montgomery was talking about in the, in the book, um, Happy Cities, that will be the essence. And, and I will call for the 17 goal of the Sustainable Development Goals. It's about partnerships, it's about collaboration, it's about bringing together many different insights to really enrich in the design of uh, our communities. Maria? Well, again, creativity is the answer here. I think uh, um, we need to, everybody talks about the, the climate change crisis, and it is a, a great crisis, and it's not an acute one uh, that will represent an emergency. It's, it's the one that will stay a long time because of the, the structural failures that it's representing. So because of that, and because we need to solve uh, or try to mitigate the causes of climate change, we have enormous opportunities. We have enormous health opportunities by doing that because tackling the causes of climate change is nothing else than common sense measures to make our cities more livable, more normal, more protective. So one thing we can do, vote, we use our vote properly and then vote in function of the, the mayor or the local uh, municipality that will offer you the opportunity to, to have better conditions. Today, a uh, few, one year ago, in yeah. London, um, for the first time ever, in the death certificate of a little girl who passed away 10 years ago, called uh, Ella Kisidebra, her mom has been fighting for 10 years, and now for the first time, she passed away with a horrible uh, form of asthma. And now for the first time on a death certificate in the, in the, uh, of this little girl, it says, cause of death, air pollution. So one day, you know, as we did with asbestos, as we did with lead, as we did with other um, heavy metals that are um, uh, dangerous for our health, the, the, the environment in where we live, it has to be as well the place where we feel protected and it's our right. So I think um, legislation has to be used as well. We need to, to use the, 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 the power of legislation, yeah. of course, advocacy, political votes and then of course create a movement and associate ourselves strongly and creatively. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for your views, your thoughts and your inspiration and uh, I think we have lots to think about and uh, uh, we will continue working on that direction. So thank you so much. Thank you. Now to continue with the second part of the debate, we will be uh, hearing the keynote speech of uh, Joseph Allen and then the conversation with uh, Norman Foster. So thank you.
It's great to be here. I want to first thank Norman, Elena, the Norman Foster Foundation, uh, and uh, Sanitas for inviting me here to present on the topic of healthy buildings. I want to talk about five fundamental shifts that are happening that are shaping the healthy buildings movement. And I talk about shaping the movement because a famous Winston Churchill quote, as many of you might know, we shape our buildings, thereafter they shape us. Thinking about healthy cities, healthy buildings are foundational to that. And I see a couple of trends happening that means that healthy building movement is not going away. The first is this. The scientific and medical literature is being rewritten because of COVID-19, the pandemic, in this way. This is a project I worked on with the New York Times to visualize what's happening in every indoor space. We are constantly emitting respiratory aerosols from our lungs. These respiratory aerosols will travel well beyond two meters or six feet. They'll accumulate indoors in places that are underventilated or underfiltered. If you look at all of the transmission that happened with COVID-19 and every super spreader event on a bus, in a school, a choir practice, a conference, they all share that same characteristic. Indoor spread in underperforming buildings. For the first year of the pandemic, the original sin was the failure to recognize airborne transmission as the dominant mode of transmission. We talked a lot about droplet transmission, large droplets, ballistic projectiles that drop out of the air within two meters or six feet. We talked a lot about fomite or surface transmission and the importance of hand washing. World Health Organization in the US, the CDC failed to acknowledge airborne transmission. Once you acknowledge this happens, then the control measures change. It becomes critical that the buildings are the first line of defense. We failed to do that for the first year, but if you look at all the medical journals right now, The Lancet, New England Journal of Medicine, you look in science, it is now full of, of peer-reviewed evidence showing that this is the dominant mode of transmission. We have to think very differently about respiratory pathogens, not just SARS-CoV-2, but also influenza, measles, TB, RSV. That's first. The second is this. That's leading to a change in the standards that are coming and how we have to design and operate and maintain our buildings. I opened a, an event at the White House of the United States, the first ever summit on indoor air quality. That's something to pay attention to when you have, at least in the United States, the biggest bully pulpit in our country talking about the importance of indoor air quality. From these meetings and convenings, the standard setting body for ventilation, ASHRAE, has announced right after this meeting that they were designing new health-based standards for ventilation. We talked about this history of how we got into this problem. We used to know how to design our buildings correctly for infectious disease control. We lost our way. Florence Nightingale, 150 years ago, the only defense a true nurse, either ass or knees, fresh air from an open window. Around the 1970s, in response to the energy crisis, we started to choke off our buildings, choke off the air supply in our buildings. ASHRAE, the standard setting body that determines ventilation in nearly every single place where you spend your time, has designed a standard since the 1970s called the Standard for Acceptable Indoor Air Quality. What's the problem with that? It's right in the name. Acceptable indoor air quality, not healthy, not health optimized, bare minimums. So it shouldn't be a surprise that we had a respiratory pathogen that spreads entirely indoors but up against buildings not designed for health with low levels of ventilation and poor filtration. Is it any wonder we had the crisis we did? This is all changing right now. In fact, the US Center for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, is changing, or is going to release very soon, new health-based uh, targets for ventilation. Based on the work of my colleagues and I, I'm a, I'm a commissioner on the Lancet COVID-19 Commission, we put forth new health-based ventilation standards. You start to see this shift. The science and medical literature is changing. The standard setting bodies are changing how they think about their buildings. The third is this. It's a terrible picture. But I, <laughs> I did a quick screen grab on CNN. Power is shifting in terms of who knows what about their space they're in. I showed this on CNN. I don't own any money in this thing. 
But this company sold out of these air quality monitors. It used to be the case you'd hire an expert like me. I've been doing forensic investigations of sick buildings for my entire career. Take an air sample, send it to a lab, write up a report. Now it's being democratized. In fact, if you look across social media, you will see people reporting on the indoor air quality in their buildings, their coffee shop, the hotel, the airplane, and telling you, building owners, designers, architects, what's happening in your building, you talk about data and the, the power of data. Now it's in the hands of other people telling you you need to know what's happening in your building. If you don't, they'll tell you what's happening in, in your building. That's number three. The fourth is this. There's a widening discussion ushered in by the pandemic about what constitutes a healthy building. This is a report that my Harvard team put out called The Nine Foundations of a Healthy Building. We talk about lighting and acoustics and biophilic design, nature-inspired design, of course, ventilation, air quality, water quality. Something we haven't talked about yet in terms of safety and security. I think a lot about this in terms of not just building design, but also city design. In the US, we have a terrible gun problem. And when I think about healthy cities, that's the first thing I go to when I think about what's happening in the US. But we now have this wider conversation opened for the first time for a lot of people with this awareness that buildings are influencing our health and what else matters for our health. But it's not just the absence of disease or the focus on that part of health, it's about these other topics we talked about. It's thriving, it's flourishing. And I want to talk about a little bit of research that Norman has shared in, um, uh, in the past around other aspects of indoor air quality and how it influences our health. And that's how indoor air quality influences cognitive function performance. We just finished a study, a global study, a couple hundred workers where we mon monitored air quality at their office and at the same time measured their cognitive function performance. And we find it striking in that blue box there that when we improve ventilation, we improve our ability to think clearly. And as Norman and I have talked about many times, that he says, well, you've quantified this. And sometimes I think we've just quantified the obvious. We've all been in a room that's stuffy or uncomfortable. We describe it as that way, stuffy. It's stale in here. We know this intuitively that the air is influencing our ability to think. The last and fifth fundamental change is the role of buildings in climate and how we have to bring these together. So buildings consume 40% of global energy in some cities like New York, where I'm from, closer to 70 or 80% of energy is consumed by buildings. And I wrote this article in Harvard Business Review in January because I felt there was a siloing happening. The pendulum had swung with, towards health when the pandemic hit. And we left a lot of our sustainability goals on the side. The pendulum is swinging back towards climate, the climate crisis, as it should. But we should not forget the lessons and learnings from what happened with COVID. And it feels like the industry is still siloed in that there, if you talk to people and say, I'm in, I'm in the green building space, I'm in the healthy building space, I'm in safe buildings. And the reality, it's all part of the same movement. And I actually think there's an overlay in terms of smart building and technology that lets us optimize all of it at the same time. It can be done. In fact, I know it can be done because Norm and I have worked together on a project in New York City, the new JP Morgan headquarters and answered that question. Can this actually be done? Can you have a healthy building that's green and safe and is a thriving place? I imagine you got that a lot in your career about this can't be done. This is the latest it can't be done and Norman showing it can be done. So this is a building, an all electric tower in the middle of New York City, sourced with renewable energy from upstate New York, double the acceptable ventilation rates that ASHRAE set, so if you're a numbers person, went from 20 CFM per person, or 10 liters per second per person, to 40 CFM per person. With a real-time indoor air quality sensor network in this space, so the building can adapt and respond in real time, autonomously, to changing conditions in the space. So it absolutely can be done. You can have a healthy building that is also a sustainable building. Very last thing, I want to mention before I bring Norman up uh, to talk is thinking about this from a public health lens and the gains we've made over the past hundred years. This is an article I wrote in Science with uh, scientists from around the world talking about the public health gains we've made 
in terms of clean water, sanitation, food safety. And where has indoor air quality been in that conversation? On average, humans spend 90% of their time indoors. If you live to your 80, 72 years of your life indoors. We've been ignoring this place that has a massive impact on our health. And the expectation should be that the air we're breathing indoors is clean, just as the expectation is that the water coming out of our taps is clean. This has to be, healthy buildings has to be part of the way we think about health more broadly going forward. Thank you. All right, I'd like to invite my friend Norman up for a, uh, a chat. Uh, first, let me say this is really fun and an honor. You and I have spoken many times and uh, have become friends over the years. So this is really quite fun. Um, I want to start with something that uh, Maria started us with, is, is thinking about the stakes. The stakes are high. 25% of all disease or health issues uh, could be resolved if we deal better with the built environment. Starts with cities, starts with buildings. Um, and you and I spoke yesterday about well, I think about buildings a lot. And you and I spoke yesterday about buildings and that kind of, and cities as that connective tissue and, I, and some of your work specifically around Bloomberg, the Bloomberg building, of how you connect my conversation that I'm having around buildings with these wider conversation around health in cities. I guess if you consider that the infrastructure of a city is the urban glue that is binding together the individual buildings. Um, and if you look at the different kinds of cities, the combination of the infrastructure, the connectivity, the public spaces, the parks, uh, the public transport, um, then I think what is interesting is that what is good for the planet is also good for the individual. So those cities which interestingly we saw a sample of, there are various um, uh, metrics, guides, but those cities which are the most desirable in terms of lifestyle, places where people want to go, to live, to work, or to visit as tourists, the tourist trail, they all have certain things in in common. They're walkable. In many ways, the earlier speakers covered this. Um, but they, I, I guess the polar opposite is the sprawling city, the, the, the uh, carbon city, which interestingly, historically, in the arc of history, is disappearing as fast mm. as it appeared. So, um, so I, I find it very reassuring. I mean, there are all kinds of caveats to that. But the desirable city, in terms of lifestyle, is also the most sustainable in terms of its, its energy, its energy per person. Um, so, so I think that, that's a, a, a really important issue for mayors. And, and in some ways, it, it all comes down to master planning. The, the master plan of London, uh, which was conceived in the height of World War II in its most established form, um, reinforced the Green Belt, which has contained that city, and it hasn't sprawled in the way that so many cities has. And it's very much the green lung of, of the city. So I want to pick up on that. Is that, um, is that by design, intention, accident. So I think, uh, at least in thinking of your career and the work I know you do, you've been ahead of this curve and, and, and everything you do has been intent, right? And I, I wonder about London post-war, like are, are these decisions that were designed with health 
as the North Star, is it after TB? This is why we did ventilation better in the early 1900s than we did today. It was in response to something, or the improvement of the waterways. The development of London or Madrid, you know, is there, has there been intent behind that around health, or what has been the driving factor? Just housing for people? Uh, what's the motivating force even back then? I think it, it is about attitude. It, it, the reality is that um, if you separate fact and data from fiction, from prejudice, you can plan. You can, um, you, you, you can use anticipatory design. And that is the history, if you like, of, of master planning. And as the earlier speakers um, noted, um, in many ways, the, uh, the response of change to health crises has created, in many ways, very beautiful heritage. I mean, the uh, cholera epidemic that we heard in the mid-19th century created the Thames Embankment. In the same way in New York, it created Central Park, the reservoir, uh, and, and, and the clean water. Um, so if you take an optimistic view in the arc of history, then if we all use intelligence in response to the current threat of climate, rising sea levels, um, we do know that we have access to clean energy. We have to use it. Um, it's a mantra, it's a personal thing. Uh, um, uh, so by design, we can plan ahead and we can address these, these issues. So coming out of the the COVID pandemic and still in the climate crisis, are these the two fundamental forces shaping the future of cities currently? Are there others? I think you've got a convergence of, of factors which could work together. So you have mobility being re-evaluated. Younger generations are not so interested in ownership they're more inclined towards uh, ride sharing. You're seeing the, uh, also on the horizon the potential for robotic vehicles, the prospect that perhaps there are fewer cars on the road, um, but they're active over a 24-hour uh, cycle. Um, that, and interestingly in the pandemic, we saw that that roads that were considered essential to the flow of traffic were suddenly given over to outdoor cafes, restaurants. So one of the consequences was, in a way, a return to, to nature and appreciation of the outdoors, outdoor dining. Um, uh, so if you then have the infrastructure which becomes obsolescent, car parks, um, and a rightful realization that recycling buildings is far more sustainable than uh, demolishing and rebuilding, notwithstanding the fact that that is also inevitable. So it's not a, a, a total solution, but the obsolete car park of yesterday can become the perfect urban farm. And so again, uh, I think we will question the, uh, the pattern of agriculture being remote in the countryside, uh, having to transport in urban farming could be a very good balance uh, where the food is fresher, um, you're using dramatically less water, less fertilizer. Um, so I, I think there's a synergy uh, in ideal world between these uh, these, 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 these changes, which are yeah. technological and social. Also seeing a different balance in terms of uh, the workplace and the home. I mean, interestingly, we've been pioneering the whole idea of healthy buildings since the late 1960s. Our first breathing building was the Sainsbury Center, which is still a breathing building as a, as a museum. Comets Bank was the first tall building where you could encourage natural ventilation for health and energy saving. And Bloomberg is also interesting, as you, as you noted in, in, in that respect. 
those uh, are buildings which have come out of an enlightened patronage, and in that sense, they've been fringe buildings. The optimistic possibility is that they become mainstream because younger generations are rightly more concerned about the quality of their environment, as you noted uh, and you know, quite rightly drew our, our attention uh, to that. So, um, so I, if, if that becomes mainstream, then you're going to get a lot of, and this is the conversation we had yesterday, a, a lot of obsolescent commercial buildings um, and an older generation of buildings which recirculate air, shallow plan, um, they are perfect for recycling as residential buildings. So I think if you put all these trends together and the realization that nature plays an important part in our, in our health, um, then I think it's it, the re exciting possibilities. I think there are also downsides in terms of some of the current uh, lifelines in terms of sustainability. Um, I mean, over 80% of electricity generated at the moment is fossil fuel. And an electric car, the battery, is the fuel tank. So if you're squirting electricity that's been made by fossil fuel, it's essentially a dirty car. Um, and um, uh, in a dense city, which is the ideal city in terms of walkability, lifestyle, sustainability, unfortunately, there's simply not enough roof to cover with solar cells that will generate that electricity. Um, and um, you know, I think there's a concern about the future. I, mean, I, I think it's fantastic that all the advances have been made in, in solar. But at the moment, solar is still dependent on a fossil fuel uh, backup. And, um, and nobody's really addressed what happens when you've kind of wallpapered or covered the countryside with cells that last 20 years. And the only solution at the moment is landfill. Mm -hmm. And those are toxic uh, minerals in there. Yeah. And, well, so a couple threads there. I, I think you, you hit on these uh, major crises in the beginning, shaping uh, what has shaped cities and the future of cities, um, and thinking about um, one in particular that I'm going to bring it back to the conversation we had yesterday, because I think a lot about this. And if we think about crises that shape the future, or maybe uh, challenges that and every challenge is an opportunity, this um, change, this remote work revolution, whatever it's called, right? The, the rise of hybrid work. Um, at least in some cities, uh, you see office vacancy 20, 30, 40% and not really coming back. Um, there's been talk about the looming debt crisis around commercial real estate finance when interest rates were zero, very low. And now with higher interest rates, who's going to be able to refinance these properties? And it seems to me, like we discussed yesterday, you're going to have a, uh, a glut. That you're going to have a lot of these buildings that are underutilized, unoccupied, possibly abandoned. You hear mayors and uh, civic leaders talking about this, trying to get people back. Washington, D.C. is talking about this a lot right now. How do we get the federal workforce back? Because Washington, D.C., the city is struggling. And the lack of people in the cities hurting the economy, but also hurting uh, social services, like the ability of the transportation system to be funded. And so you had some interesting ideas on how, you know, what, if that's a force that's shaping cities, what, do, what are city leaders to do with this property? It's regenerative in what, in what way, right? We don't destroy these buildings, what do we do with them? I think in, you know, the healthy city is a city which is diverse, equitable, affordable. It's a rich mix. Um, it's, and, uh, and, and we know that all those organic forces are at play. But policy decisions can have dramatic effects. So for example, um, you could say like Google, that the workplace will be designed 
not just architecturally but politically to be so desirable that that, that workplace like Google will provide the free meals, it will provide the gym, um, uh, the dry cleaning, everything that you need as a kind of one stop, you just go to work. Unfortunately, the knock-on effect of that is that the whole area around that kind of enterprise is dead because all the local gyms, dry cleaners, cafes, restaurants die. It's interesting you quoted Bloomberg um, in terms of its environmental policies, its fresh air, the way it pulls air in, moves it, take, extracts it at the core of the, uh, of the building. But there's another aspect to that. The architecture creates a shortcut through a very large building as an arcade, which then, that with the base of the building, is specifically designed to attract new restaurants, gyms, and so on. And the Bloomberg policy is not to provide any of those facilities within the building, but to subsidize those who work in the building so that they have um, access to the local gyms. Um, it has its own pantry, which offers snacks, but it consciously doesn't offer meals. The result is that the area around it is, is, is thriving. So policy decisions, as well as architectural decisions, have dramatic effect on the health of the city. Um, uh, so yes, it does come down in the end to the political domain. It does yeah. come down uh, to mayors and those who exercise their, their power wisely. And we've seen you know, when individuals, I guess it does come in the end down to leadership. Yeah. And, um, and that's in some respects politically rather thin on the ground. Agree. And, um, and I think outside of political leadership though, I, I, what I hear too though is the leadership on your end on the design side and the leadership in terms of uh, Mike Bloomberg and others to, to say, yes, we will have a building that has a cut through in it, that we want to invite community, we want our people to be part of the community. So that's a leadership decision too, Dis separate from the decisions around uh, siting and things like this, but what you're going to do with your building and how that's going to shape not just the experience in the building, but as you've done and showed that experience uh, that your building is going to have on that community. To me, it seems to be that's the, the magic, the connective um, thread. I'm, I'm a guest in your city, uh, and uh, it's my first time here, and I've, I've, I've loved it. it. I've just walked and walked and walked, and I feel the connective thread. I feel the community. Uh, it's gorgeous. Uh, it has all the right ingredients. It really I mean, does. It has the, the mixture of activities. Um, I mean, the area immediately around the foundation is, is fascinating. It's predominantly residential, but not exclusively residential. Yeah. So, uh, so commercial, quite small uh, offices, lawyers, architects, whatever, are embedded in that fabric, which supports local restaurants. Um, and, um, and it's just a, a great walkable city, and what a climate. Uh, yeah. Quite aside from I the food, yeah. <laughs> uh, so we're very blessed. Um. So we're wrapping up in the last minute or two here. I want to invite maybe one or two questions uh, from the audience, or so to dominate uh, the time here with Norman. Is there a, a pressing question on this issue of uh, healthy cities in particular, but uh, how architecture is um, uh, is shaping those cities? Or if not, I'll give Norman a minute to think about. Um, uh, closing remarks, and maybe I'll just wrap up with a, a certain thread. Yes, please. Uh, I want to uh, thank first all of you because I think it has been a really exciting uh, dialogue. My name is Maika Garcia Ipola. I'm from the Navarra University here in Spain. Um, the other day I, I did an interview for ABC for the newspaper, and they asked me about. Uh, the relation between architecture and the user, and I said uh, the user is in the center versus the object. No, we were really fans of objects. I'm an architect. 
um, I said the, the, the planet is going to survive. I don't know if we are going to survive as an species, no? Uh, in that thing, my question is about the city. I'm questioning the city. I mean, is really the city the model we want to live in? We are going to be working remotely, but we want to have a community. We're going to have our children going to schools where we want them to be related to other children. We had the pandemic in the schools, no? And, and we remember also the, 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 the another pandemic in the 1930s with the air open schools, no? Where they were not efficient with the planet, but efficient with the human being, no? So my question is, do, do we need to still live in cities? Are the cities still something we need to have? Or how big should a city be? I think it's actually a really nice question for final thoughts on this. Is, is do, do we need cities? What is the future of cities? I'll give Norman a minute. I, I want to mention uh, my last thoughts related to that question. We definitely need cities, of course. Uh, and uh, the scale of movement towards cities is only growing. If you think about India, 400 million people will move to cities by 2050. That's like adding a Madrid every month, starting today for the next 30 years. That's daunting, but it also means an opportunity. I'm very optimistic about what that future looks like in India and everywhere else. We've talked a lot about structures and the built environment, but one thing we haven't talked about, which I ultimately know leads to the biggest determinants in health, and that's the social determinants of health. I think about my own city of Boston, and I know this is, exists in other cities. In what we call the Back Bay, a wealthy neighborhood, life expectancy 90 years, a few miles away in Roxbury, a few miles, a few kilometers, life expectancy is 60 years. A 30-year life expectancy difference in a few miles in the same city. That's education, that's poverty, that's access to health care, that's racism, all tied into the shaping of our cities. So we talk about cities, and the, the biggest uh, opportunity we have for, to really advance health for everybody is to address this, the inequities that, it, that exist in cities. And we have the opportunity to in the coming years as we see this, uh, the continuing rise of cities. Norman. Cities go back, really, to the beginning of society. I mean, it's been said that it's uh, society's greatest invention. Um, more people, as we know, live in cities now more than half by 2050. It's expected to be three quarters. Um, we're all here in this room. We don't have to be here. We could Zoom. We could participate on a screen. Some of us are going to a restaurant afterwards. We don't have to do that. We could have takeaway, sitting at home, all on our own. We're social animals. We come together, and cities generate wealth, they generate opportunity. Look at innovation. The history of patents is the history of cities. Um, I th there's a cyclic movement, and there's been the movement away from the city because the city had dirty industries embedded in it. That led to a pendulum swing of zoning where everything got separated out. And um, that was, in the words of an earlier speaker, dead boring, um, <laughs> because people didn't come together. So I think the city is alive and well. I think it's going to prosper. I think it's going to get better, greener, safer. I think its future is totally assured. And there will always be the choice for those who don't want to be in the city to be somewhere else. So <laughs> and choice is the ultimate luxury. So uh, there we are. That's great. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, thank you, Norman. Thank you. Thank you. I think they want a photo. Thank you, everyone. That concludes uh, the uh, the public debate. Thank you.